podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome to episode 42 of The Therapy Show with Jackie Jones and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And what we're going to be talking about this week is the use of silence in therapy or silence in therapy. Yeah. Before I start on that, I really like your uh, reminding me of time chronology. You know, this is... The episode. 42. Yeah, we've got 43. 43. I quite like that because it gives me a sense of time chronology. And also, uh, I think, oh, gosh, this this is quite a body of work we're doing, which is quite nice. Yes, and for anybody that it's the first time they've listened, they can go back and listen to 41 other ones. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Now, silence. Now, how about starting with what you just started with off air to me about silence, and then I can talk about it. Yes. When I first qualified, silence petrified me in the therapy room. I felt so uncomfortable. In fact, I'd even go as far as to say in the early days, I filled the silence with meaningless chatter to just fill the silence. Yeah, I understand that. And of course, a lot of therapists have their own issues about having to fill silence, just like you said. Yeah. Very, <laughs> very, very, very common. Silences are very common in the therapeutic process. Very powerful as well, though. Very powerful, and therapists and clients have their own issues about silence, I think. And on any psychotherapy training program, um, you know, uh, the use of silence is often, you know, taught and what to do with silence and the counter transference of the uh, therapist issues are around transform, I mean, around silence and how important yeah. silence is. So, silence in many ways, of course, is, um, you know, time for you know, to reflect. So in other words, the therapist um, may just hold the silence to give the um, client the time to reflect on what you're talking about, time to um, think about their own inner processes. Yeah. Silence might also be how one discussion points ends and another one starts. So the so you know the, there's these these ways, but I think particularly to allow the client to take ownership of their own reflection uh, of their own inner processes. Yeah, it's a really important consideration uh, when silence occurs in the psychotherapeutic process. Yeah, and and I think what you said is exactly right as always, Bob. You know, it it's what silence means to us as individuals and what that can represent and Mm. yeah how yeah for me when I was growing up silence usually meant that there was trouble brewing (laughs) which is why I don't like silence it Mm. it usually meant that there was trouble on the horizon when I was at home Yeah. yeah so that would be your own therapeutic issue and might be part of the counter transference that you looked at in your training to be a therapist and yeah and everything that goes with that and you know when a as i've just said a client i think it's really important for a client to have the time yeah take ownership of their own reflections and their own in, inner world yeah of what's happened and then of course we have to think developmentally as well in terms of what silence meant just like you've just talked about for you yeah and help the person look at how the past often gets you know played out in uh, in the present and the sort of relationships they might pick so they might pick people who if you're going to recreate you know create create history might be different might be the same um but if they feel like they've been you know dismissed or they feel like they're not assertive or they feel like they're quiet in relationships the 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 actual clue to this will be developmental yes yeah yeah definitely i can remember in a supervision once asking my supervisor is there a limit to how long people should be quiet for 
Mm. At what point do we break the silence? Mm. They said that they've spent virtually a whole session in silence. Well, that's an interesting one because when does silence become punishing? Yeah. Is a question mark. So, so I, I, I think that um, that would be too long for me. Psychoanalytically, I understand it. Client-centered counseling, I understand it. But, you know, for some people in their histories developmentally, they may have, um, it might be a place where silence became punishing or they were punished if they spoke or, you know, we could go on with the decisions or perhaps one of the slogans in the client's history and their family of origin was, you know, kids should be seen and not heard. Yeah. But they yeah. thought they had to, you know. So I think it's dangerous personally. Well, danger is a strong word. But I think it's naive actually to, to just always wait for the client to speak. Yeah. I, understand. I think I would inquire. Yeah. What's you, happening to you now? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. How are you feeling with the silence and, and bring it into the room as opposed to it? just happening if that makes sense yeah without without doubt um and it's a very very good question it's a very good question to your supervisor you know how long do we wait as therapist to uh, and i don't think as a i don't think there's a sort of right answer to this but i think you all get a clue if you've done some what they call a ta script analysis yeah. Looking at how the past affects the present. Yeah. And looked at, you know, what silence meant for somebody developmentally in their history would give you a clue. Yes. To, um, you like, when to breach what silence means for a person. Yeah. Because again, touching on what you, you said earlier on, you know, about silence can be punishing. I think, you know, that's a, a really relevant thing if we're ignored as a punishment you know or sent to Coventry when we're growing up and nobody speaks to us and things like that then silence is going to be a, a, you know yeah punishing in the therapy room oh, and it may be it may be um so it's very important I think to ask the questions that you've just um brought up you know you know as you're reflecting here or well, see, that's an assumption, so I probably wouldn't even say that. You know, I'd probably inquire, like you said, I'd probably inquire and say, you know, could you just tell me what's happening for you on the inside at the moment? Yeah. So it would be a, what I call a phenomenological inquiry, looking at what's actually happening yeah. at the internal level. Now, they might say, oh, well, I don't know. Or, you see, there's many reasons why somebody can be silent. One of them could be fear. Yeah. One could be they frozen themselves. Yeah. One could be they're highly adapting to you. Yep. There's many different yep. reasons. Um, so you, you can acquire in the here and now, and you could also inquire developmentally. Yeah. Yeah. I think is the best route. Yeah. Because there are times where it's it's a comfortable thing in the room as well. You, you know. It, only the other day, literally, as soon as I put the camera on, the client broke down crying. <laughs> you know, obviously something had happened. And, you know, all I said was, it's OK, take a minute. Take as long as you need. It's OK. And it was a comfortable silence. It it didn't feel heavy or abandoned mm. or anything. It was it seemed appropriate at the time. Yeah. And that's because I suspect two or three reasons. One's expect you've got a relationship with the client. Yeah. Um, and second reason, which is I think is really important, is that you gave a permission. You you know two permission transactions there. Yeah. It's okay if you take your time. It's okay to be, you know, you, you were giving permissions and you knew the history. I suspect of the client, but you know, and with, not with that one in particular, I brought the silence. Hmm. Again, it could it could be you know me looking at my developmental stages, but I thought it it was more comfortable for me to break the silence than for them to break yeah. the silence. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I think 
and we've said it four times, developmental inquiry is very important. Now, I'll give you an example of something. In 1993, I think it was, I went to the Minister's Centre in, in um, London, which is a training for psychotherapy centre, psychoanalytically, if you like. And I went for some training in a, in a psycho psychoanalytical framework called object relations. Now, that's a sort of um, part of the psychoanalytical sort of tradition, object relations. But the thing I wanted to tell you, I was, I, I was doing some training and the person who was training me was a psychoanalyst. And she, she said in part of the training, would anybody like to have a go on the couch? And what that means is the major tool um, uh, for psychoanalysts, traditionally, classically, and still is for some, though a lot of these psychoanalysts have moved off the couch now, is the person lies down on the couch with free association. And you can say what you want to say or can say nothing. And then the analyst in the 50 minutes might make one or two or three interpretations. It's a different type of uh, approach to healing, were very popular 100 years ago. And in fact, Freudian analysts, Jungian analysts are still very popular. And I, I remember, oh, I said, I'll have a go then. And um, I lay on the couch and it was the quickest way for me to go into paranoid fantasies I know of. Wow. And, you know, uh, because I went straight into, I wonder what the person's thinking about me, have I done anything wrong? Um, so the silence became bearable. So I just talked to fill it, really. But yeah. under that was intense fear. And I think for a lot of clients, especially the more disturbed clients, um, if you don't know their histories, you don't really know what silence means for them. No. No. And that's that's really important, Bob. What you've said there, yeah. You don't know what it means to them. Not what totally. Yeah. Yeah. You can guess, and with schizoid clients, clients that are withdrawn, particularly, they'll present a social self, and if they think they think the therapist wants silence to continue, they'll just be silent. If they think they want the therapist to just fill the space, they'll fill it. So, I I think with we really do need to know what silence means for a person in their history. If you're just going to use the technique of silence as a way of, I don't know, attempting to trigger some processes, or or even if you'd go down the line of allowing them to take responsible for the responsibility for their own reflection, uh, I understand that. that, that um, and I think it's, it's very uh, apt, as I said, in many places. However, I think there's trick missing if you don't know what silence means for them yeah yeah because we can easily again you know i know we spoke about it in the past we can project our own thoughts and feelings around silence onto the client as in oh this is how i feel when i'm quiet so maybe that's what they're feeling we don't know we don't know at all no i, I and i do know that um many clients do feel what you said at the beginning and most of this, you don't know where they're thinking, for example, well, I wonder what the therapist thinks I should be doing here. Yeah. Perhaps I should be a perfect client and keep quiet. Or yep. perhaps I should be a perfect client to say something. Yep. Or I wonder what the therapist is thinking about me. Perhaps there's something wrong with me, so I better just keep my head down. Yeah. Go is it on my job on. to speak or is it theirs? Do I stay quiet until they start talking? What, what are the rules around silence in the therapy room? Yeah. yeah. And... It is a useful, you know, to think about, but I'll say it again. If you don't know what science means in their history, then you're, you've got a hard road to follow, really, and you could get it drastically wrong with clients. You could actually um, go down a road where you repeat history for the client. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which... I, su I suppose, again, it, it's always best, I find, and it works well for me, to bring everything back into the room, yeah. <laughs> you know, and to, to share how I felt in that situation and, you know, potentially how you were feeling in that situation and things and just bring everything back and have an open discussion about it. That's why I love therapy. 
Well, yes, yes and no. I mean, I'm not saying I don't want to take a, away from relational therapists who may or may not use the relationship. And if you get somebody's, um, you know, a schizoid withdrawn client, somebody whose drive is being perfect or, or particularly pleasing other people, then they're just going to agree with you or they're just going to go along with you when you go back and when they listen to you talk about what it means for you, they'll probably adapt and fulfill. So I think, you know, when people say about working relationally, I think a question, I know this podcast is not about this, but they need to ask themselves, what relationship are they talking about? Yeah. So I don't want to, then this podcast isn't about relational work. No, but, but I, it's, it's valid. It's an important thing. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to say also there's not, you know, dismiss what you've just said about bringing everything back into the relationship. Because it can be very useful. But it also um, may be repeating history for them. Yeah. So, for example, let me give you an example of something, right? Yeah. Now, in my household, the wor- one of the worst frightening aspects for me was sitting around a table and talking with people or my family of origin. Yeah. That is the worst thing possible because it was very excruciating and everything was termed as my fault if I opened my mouth. Or that's what I thought anyway. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, uh, if we think, I'm thinking of another person here, uh, particularly, a um, friend of my daughter's who, who had a, I, know, I could think of many clients actually, who they had a, they had a history where, they had a wonderful time at the dinner table. It was where the family actually had the most sense of intimacy. They were given permissions to actually talk about themselves and to actually express things. So for them, talking, they were given permission to talk. Um, so, so, so we have two completely different. Yeah. And then what happens is the people make their own scripts and their own decisions from their early developmental history. And then that gets played out in the relationships they choose and their life they then choose. So yeah. I could have gone down a way, which probably for a lot of my life I might have done, uh, which was to be, well, I didn't become a monk, but I kept <laughs> away from relationships. Yeah, yeah. So think about silence for me in the therapy room was purgatory. Yes, yeah. For another person, it actually, it was really important that they talk, that the, you know, their, their aspect was silence was um, a difficult for them. So until you know what silence means, you can end up repeating history for someone. Yeah. And it is all these little nuances that, that we don't know how it impacts on the other person. You will by developmental inquiry then. Yes. Yeah. Which is, I suppose, what I'm going on about in this podcast, I know. And I think it's, while we're going on, I think it's because therapists themselves can assume that just silence is always useful in the psychotherapy process. And out of that, you will go XXX. And it's not necessarily true. No, no, and I can understand that. I, I, I find it excruciating. Like I said, I feel like I, I need to fill it with something. Yeah. And Which then is kind of what I used to do when I was younger. I would dis- distract yeah. from the silence and, you know, metaphorically, I was that kid in the corner doing a little dance, trying to keep everybody happy because yeah. it was so heavy in the room. Yeah. yeah. The therapist might say, oh, well, that just shows it's all mis- to the grill or whatever the phrase is. And that may be true. And you might have got it dreadfully wrong. So I think we need to think a lot about what silence means and, you know, and also what silence means for the therapist. Yeah. Which is a really big subject area, you know, in terms of the counter-transference. Yeah. Because sometimes, as far as the counter-transference, you know, putting that aside a bit, but sometimes the client needs time to think and to reflect yeah 
And if there's a big disconnection between thinking and feeling, then it's useful to have space to perhaps take ownership of what they might be thinking and feeling without the therapist um, taking ownership of what the client may be thinking and feeling. Yeah, and f- filling in the gaps for them. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's taught in most client-centered counseling courses, that's taught as a way of looking at silence. And this is a very way, a very important way and an important way of thinking. And I think it's very important. And I believe there's also other things to consider. Yeah. To be fair, Bob, in like everything in the therapy room, it's a minefield. <laughs> You're dodging bullets and stepping over tripwires all the time. It, you, I use, you know, if people often still say to me, "Oh, so you just sit in a room and talk with people?" And it's like, <laughs> well, it is at one level that's true, and at another level, I'd I'd say peoples. Yes. Yeah. People. It's very, it's no, it's not singular, it's plural. No. Yeah. Because you're teaching that you're talking to the younger self. Yeah. You're talking to the elder self. You're talking to the dissociated self. You're talking to the withdrawn self. You're talking to the angry self. So it's it's plural rather than singular. Yeah. And the other thing, I know we're probably going off track a bit here now, but I think it was Steffi who, who once said um in, in a therapy session that. You know, in the therapy room, it's like an amphitheater. <laughs> There's that, I've got that many parts of me in the room and, you know, the client has got that many parts of themselves in the room, you know, and our parents and our parents' parents and our parents' parents' parents. Literally, it's a wonder any work gets done in there because there's that many people in the room. Yeah. Well, you're talking about Stephanie Cook, she's my wife, so she says some very wise things, but I'm going to, and I'm going to say something, that's I would give a plea for contracts because if you have contracts right at the beginning of the psychotherapy and start to look at what the person wants or doesn't want then you you can you can concentrate more on one thing I know many other things come up in the process of of therapy but you can always recontract but you can um, look more specifically but Stephanie is right as she often is in many ways um, there's many different echoes and ghosts and different types of people and historical avenues in the therapy room. So it's in many ways, silence can be dead, deadening and very loud. Yeah, it's just something that always stuck with me. It's a vision or a visualisation that I always have. It's a good one to have because I think it can remind us of the fact that so much actually is happening for the two people in the room yeah yeah and again you know looking looking at what you've been talking about about the in- integrative psychotherapy and we all have different masks on and different sides of ourselves and everything and it, it, i agree completely with what you say it's not a person it's persons <laughs> that are in the room mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. whether that's developmental and us at different ages or whether that's different parts of ourselves it's it is it's a bit like the matrix in there it is and i think it's really important to uh think about silence as i said in development but also to give the person the or allow the space to um uh come to fruition so that the client can start to put connections from thinkings and feelings but also of course maybe they've never had somebody listen to them in the silence again yeah do you you know i suppose it is something to do with silence would you ever play music in the therapy room oh i've done that so many times have you if if a client felt uncomfortable in a quiet space would you have background music or or anything oh no i thought you were going to say something else have i done music therapy i thought it was going to be the question that'd be a good podcast by the way uh, you're talking about something different aren't you you're talking about having music on in the therapeutic room as a soothing soothing object yeah maybe you know the if a client was feeling overwhelmed with the silence in the room that you know they could 
potentially ask for some sort of background music to be on while they were in there or you know I'm, I'm one of those therapists that I'm up for anything if a client says yeah, you know, as long as it's not yeah. hard rock or anything yeah, yeah. but you see I think the most important question the most important question is is how will this help you or hinder you yeah that's the question so how will this help you or hinder you in terms of the therapy process so yes we could go and put some music on and how will that help here or how in fact may it hinder you i think there has to be an inquiry again a developmental inquiry before you before anyone just goes along and because often it's a defense process to take them away from contact with you, to take them away from contact with themselves, and yeah. maybe even to take themselves away from their own histories. So I'd want to know the purpose of the plea. Yeah. Because if my job is to help them get in touch with themselves and heal themselves, then I need to ask that question. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes therapy can be about learning to be comfortable in an uncomfortable feeling. <laughs> Learn to be comfortable in an uncomfortable feeling. Well, that's an interesting one. So I'm not quite sure what you mean about it, but I think of it developmentally again, I can perhaps make sense of that transaction. But I'm not sure how you meant it. Well, if we're feeling anxious or worried or anything, then it, it's it's knowing that it's okay to be anxious and worried. We can be okay in a not okay feeling, if that makes sense. A feeling isn't going to harm us. A feeling's not going to hurt us. It's about learning that it will pass. Oh, well, that's a different permission. Yes, absolutely. But we need to get to the source of anxiety, surely. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And if you remember, most clients that come through the door, and again, this isn't the podcast, but are, are unconsciously trying to distract you and take you away from actually getting to the connection. where it is, yeah. Path. Yeah. And then if you're going to get seduced into that, then you, you'll just keep in keeping the process of comfort and uh, adult processes but you won't get down to what it's really about yeah right. that's another good title for a podcast looking at trap doors and open doors and those sort of things and what i call defense systems yeah 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 clients are really good at deflecting and yeah well, that, but you see jackie they've had to be yes yeah of course and i do it i i but it's not the therapist's job to get carried away with that no if they do then they're really helping the client repeat history really yeah most clients don't know don't know what they want probably but more much more important they of course will be always attempting to deflect the therapist from where they actually need to go because it's too painful yeah silence might be one of them yes yes a silent place might be too overwhelmingly painful for them. They'll do anything to not go there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, again, it's a really good point, particularly if there are any, you know, newly qualified therapists here, that that's, that is what clients do. They will avoid going to the place that yeah. change happens and therapeutically, yeah, yeah. as and a defence and a survival mechanism. Yeah, you're not doing them any service to go with, uh, you know, with, with the deflection. Now, you may choose to do it clinically because the timing is not right. Yeah. But that's a different podcast, the use of timing within the therapeutic process, perhaps. Yeah. So you may choose to, from a clinical place, to come back to it later. Yeah. Yeah. So... Is silence golden, Bob, as it says in the song? I don't know. <laughs> I do know that there needs to be an inquiry about what silence means for the client. Yeah. 
before the therapist willy-nilly decides to just never talk in the therapeutic process yes yeah yeah I think I think I I do have a cutoff point I think obviously taking on board what I'm seeing in the client if a client is upset and they're just composing themselves and they need you know some some space I've had clients that actually need to go out of the room to just you know go to the bathroom and wash the face with water and then come back and then kind of it's a different person that walks in through the door than the one that was out they're just not ready to share certain things at that moment yeah and then the therapist needs to ask well, going away from the silence or going away from me did that help or did that hinder the process yeah yeah I love listening to you, Bob. So, what do we know? What, do, <laughs> do we know what we're doing next time on episode forty-three? Yeah, I sent you a long a, list, the biggest list of topics in the world, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what <laughs> what was the one on the list under silence. But do you know? I don't you, know. No. Are so, we going to surprise people? We'll we just can surprise people. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I'm going to get this list, list out, so at least I know. I, I actually copied it, and I've got it on a Word document. I could get it up and look at it, but I'm not going to do. We'll surprise yeah. people. We'll surprise people for the yes. next one. Okay, uh, don't. Yeah, I, I went through those. It took me about... It was While I was watching the Peaky Blinders, so an episode of... Peaky Blindness from 2013. Um, I wrote at least 60 or 70 topics, which I sent to you. It was um, two pages full, Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, we'll take one of them. Yes, yes, we will. <laughs> okay, no, thank you. About this podcast. I just really talk, enjoy talking about these two. I enjoy talking about silence because, you know, I, I've, I, think, I think there's so much counter transference for the third beast around silence. Yes, yeah. Definitely, there, there was for me. Yeah. yeah, that's how we started the podcast. It, yes, definitely, and I'll end it that same way. I'm better at it. I'm better. I'm better in my own, <laughs> my own silence and my own thoughts. A lot better. <laughs> Therapy's worked. Therapy has worked really well for me as well. I think going through the process of it all, I always get something from my clients as well. Yeah, and you also perhaps I should pay for it a bit, but um, <laughs> yeah, seriously, sometimes I think that the other thing as well that often comes to me, and maybe we should could do one on this is that sometimes the universe gives me clients at certain yeah. times, I'm yeah. experiencing yeah. something, and then suddenly I will get clients where I'm working on myself in the process, which is a bit <laughs> weird. <laughs> I think anybody listening to this, especially if they're a therapist, uh, will, uh, will, will have empathy about that sentence. I've heard it so many times, and I think it's true in some synchronistic way. Yes, the universe is somewhere Somewhere in all of this. Right, okie doke. Until next time, Bob, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.